from the New York Times Learning Network. I'm Ross Flatt. Welcome to the first installment of our 2020-21 writing webinar series, documenting teenage lives in extraordinary times. Today, we'll be taking a look at our newest contest and showing you ways that your students can participate. So let's get started. We have a lot to cover today. We're going to first identify the benefits of participating in the coming of age in 2020 contest. We're going to then learn about this new contest and how your students can participate. And we'll also be hearing from other educators and you'll have a chance to brainstorm ways to incorporate this contest into your curriculum. Joining us today uh, are myself, professional development manager at The Learning Network. And I'm also joined by Catherine Schulten, editor at The Learning Network and the brains behind this contest. So we'll be introducing Catherine in just a second. First, as I said, we'll be identifying the benefits of participating in this coming of age in 2020 contest. Now, before we really get started and dive into this contest, we have a interactive for you. So what we first want you to do is take a look at your surroundings, wherever you are. It might be in an office, maybe your classroom, uh, maybe your kitchen table. And we want you to find one object that tells a story, small or large, about your experience of the pandemic. It can be anything. State what that object is in the chat. We'll come back to this later. I'm seeing window, blue light blocking glasses, coffee grinder, dental retainer, plants, avocados, a mask, pill box. All right. So I'm seeing a ton of stuff. Oh, this is great. All right. So I'm very excited to uh, revisit this. We're going to come back to this list later. So obviously remember what you shared. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about this contest. So first, I want to just welcome our guest today, Catherine Schulten. Welcome, Catherine. Hi, guys. Thanks, Ross. So Catherine, this is a brand new contest. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot to unpack and explain here. So can you tell us what exactly is this contest? I am so distracted looking at everybody's amazing answers. I'm gonna have to remove my eyes from the dental retainer. Um, this contest is easily the biggest and most ambitious contest that the Learning Network's ever run in over 10 years now of running contests. But what I want you to know right up front is it's also the easiest to enter. Um, we are literally, I mean, in our dreams, every teenager in the United States participates this in some way or another. We're literally asking every teenager to just tell us something big or small about their experience of this insane year. Um, and what makes it so ambitious for us is that we're letting them do it, not just in writing, which many of our contests are, but writing uh, or images or video or audio. Almost anything kids can think of and upload digitally is allowed for this contest. And that includes um, ephemera from their life in the previous two thirds of this year or new stuff they make. Um, I'm not gonna get into details now, but I hope by the end of the webinar, everybody has a good idea of what would be appropriate for your kids and how it might fit in. Cause you're, we're, you're gonna hear a ton of ideas for this. All right, so there is a, there's a ton of ideas, a ton of stuff that people can enter. Why bring in this new contest? Why this contest and why are we doing it now? Right, so I guess what I wanna to say to you about that is we just wanted to meet this moment. We just wanted to do something that felt equal to what is happening to kids right now. Um, you know, it's not just the pandemic for them, although it is certainly the pandemic, but the fight for racial justice, the, you know, an economic collapse, the 2020 election. Um, if you're a kid out West, you went through wildfires maybe, or, you know, there's been other natural disasters elsewhere. It's been an insane year that will really kind of define this generation. And we wanted to do something that was just as relevant as it could possibly be to what kids are experiencing now. And the only way we could figure out to do it is to make it as open-ended as we've made it. So um, I, and we also hope it's lightweight for teachers to incorporate. And that's a lot of what we'll be talking about today. Mm -hmm. So are we doing what museums are doing? What's, what's happening here? Yeah, that's interesting. Cause that's a little bit, um, I, I won't say the motivation, but, Certainly, this isn't an idea we made up. Museums all over the country right now are asking people to document their experiences, right? And the Times had a piece that I recommend you guys all read. We're going to take you through it here a little bit. 
this year will end eventually, document it while you can. That went up in July. Um, and it, the, the whole idea of it is we're all field collectors now, and we all have stories to tell, and generations in the future will not believe all the stuff that, you know, if you're a 13-year-old kid, you're dealing with right now. So, so talk about it. So these are um, screenshots from the article, and I think you can see some of the examples here, right? There's um, this, this is a diary that a person kept who got COVID in March, and you can see all the hopeful things that she was going to spend her time doing all X'd out because, uh, you know, she was sick in bed. Um, this, this person is an NPR producer, and she decided to make soundscapes of her L.A. neighborhood during the quiet April time when everybody was inside. Um, this piece, I believe, is obviously it's from the protest, but I think it might have been from Lafayette Square in, in Washington, D.C., and um, field collectors, curators were actually out there telling people to save stuff like this because it was so valuable. And we have, oh, and, we, we, have a, we have a couple more. Uh, wait, why don't we just talk about um, wait, one or two more of these? Yeah, this this is from, I believe, in front of the Schoenberg Center in New York City. And it's just, um, you know, after George Floyd died, it was just a spontaneous outpouring of community, uh, you know, grief on the sidewalk. So that was captured in a photo. Um, these are all in the article, by the way. This one's my single favorite because it's by a 14 year old. This is a girl who uh, was experiencing herself, I believe, anti Asian um, xenophobia right around the time that the pandemic started and made this poster, which is now going to be in one of the museums downtown that, in New York City that's devoting a, a feature to that. With that in mind, let's kind of let's go back to those objects. So we just looked at a lot of different objects from, from the pandemic. And now we would like everybody to think back to that object that you that, that you had. Maybe it's right next to you. And we want you in the chat to share the object again. But now add on what is its relationship to your life during the pandemic, big or small? I was frantically trying to go through all of the all of the different uh, items that I'm seeing in the chat. So I saw somebody mention their cast iron pan. Somebody um, somebody mentioned explain the dental retainer, but I didn't catch it. Uh, <laughs> Catherine, anything that anything that uh, stuck out to you? Yeah, I love mask. My new appendage that came early. I, I think a lot of good stuff's coming, but boy, do I relate and. Um, a few somebody talks about their yellow mug, their messy desk. Uh, I really relate to the bird person because I myself bought these binoculars during this pandemic. I never cared about birds before. All of a sudden, I seem to care. I don't know. Um, yeah, the, they're it's lovely, and it's as you can see, it was so easy to do that. Like we're all surrounded by things that remind us of this time, and it's very easy to talk about what it says about our life. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of imagined it would just be, you know, a lot of, um, you know, like a lot of people mentioning a mask or something that you immediately associate, but so many unexpected things and obviously mm -hmm. a ton of, a ton of stories. So how does this, so Catherine, how does this apply to students? Why did we do this exercise? What is, how does this connect to the contest? So this connects because we the main message we want to give you guys in this webinar, honestly, is how easy it is to participate in this contest. And we hope you'll take that message back to your kids. In order to launch the contest a couple of weeks ago, early September, those of you who know the Learning Network probably know that we ask a question every single school day and it's open for comment to kids around the world, right? Um, and we routinely get hundreds of comments on those. So we ask, how has 2020 challenged or changed you? And in those questions, in those um, what we call our student opinion feature, we always link out to an article that contextualizes what we're asking. In this case, we use the very same article that we just showed you, the one about document your life right now, and we use the art from it. One of the sub questions we ask is, what would you give a museum right now that would be a, an artifact that would document your life? Very similar to what we just asked you guys to do. And the answers, I just went through and pulled a few out that uh, like would all be great for this contest. I'll start with this one. Um, there, one girl wrote, there's this one photo of my boyfriend and me where we have our face shields on and we're sitting on my front porch at a distance. He's playing his guitar and singing to me. 
That represents love during quarantine, and I think it'll be important to future generations. So we just want kids to know what's already on their camera roll probably speaks volumes like that one does. Mm. And and we had a, a, a lot more. I mean, somebody talked about toilet paper rolls. That's one of the most... <laughs> That's been one of the biggest artifacts. I think a lot of people uh, want to share. There was uh, something about how their um, their, their room uh, really isn't clean anymore, and it was a picture of their room being clean. Um, and that's not going to be happening anymore under under quarantine. <laughs> we had a really interesting one about about dinner plates, uh, and it this one was kind of talking just a little bit about you know. Um, uh, how dinner and and uh, and that kind of thing has changed under quarantine. Uh, any others that really really struck out? Because I'm noticing that some are very clear and concrete, and others are a little bit more abstract, or that the connections you kind of have to do a little bit more thinking in in a good way. Yeah, yeah, and those are like often worth it. You know, you guys. I'm assuming everybody on this uh, webinar teaches kids, and you know. Sometimes you got to dig, but when you do, you get gold. So here's a good example of that is um, I, I shortened this very much, but the girl explains how when she was younger in, you know, in her nerdy middle school years, she loved K-pop. She loved that uh, boy band BTS. And she had moved on from that. She's a grown up now, you know. But when Black Lives Matter happened, she saw, and here's a tweet to show it, she saw that BTS, quote, opened their pockets and donate, donated $1 million to Black Lives Matter. Um, and she says, I was shocked. The Korean boy band I listened to in eighth grade donated to a movement in support of people that look like me. Then I was completely floored when the fandom matched the amount as well. So again, these aren't things the kids have turned into our contest, but all of these are things that could turn into submissions. I think they're all beautiful and so interesting. Mm, yeah, it's, it, it seems like there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. And the idea of you know students being able to you know really have their voice heard in this contest is there, there's so many uh, there's so many options. So to that end, we uh, we wanted to talk to some teachers who were interested in in running this contest, and we spoke to several teachers last week from all over the United States, uh, different subjects, and we wanted to know why they were interested in doing this contest. So let's take a look and a listen at what they had to say. Hi, I'm Jessica Hunter. Uh, my name is Gabriel Graña. My name is Kim Butterfield, and I teach AP Language and Composition at Central High School in La Crosse, Wisconsin. I am the librarian at Smith Middle School in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I teach high school English at Plainview JFK High School in Long Island, New York. I was attracted to this contest because one thing that's really important to me in my classroom is making sure that I'm always connecting students to what is relevant to their lives and um, what is current in the world. They're eager to talk about um, worldly events as well as like how it's been impacting them. Um, so I think it's just, uh, it's a great opportunity to do that. This is a situation right here, right now, that is unlike anything else. They are living through history right now, and they might not realize it because they're in it, but perspective-wise, 10, 20 years down the road, this is something they will talk about with peers and other people. Right now, this is a, a, a rare moment um, that they have the opportunity to capture. We are living in such interesting times right now that I just thought coming of age in 2020 is such a unique um, topic to talk about, and to hear a teenager's perspective um, is awesome. I think it's a really good opportunity for every student to express themselves in the manner that's right for them and in a way that they feel comfortable doing it. Often we don't think to have students really publish their work. It's, you know, they, they write something, they turn it into their teacher, and they have the same audience every time. For them to be able to submit something to the New York Times and hopefully have it published, um, I mean, that's, that's, that's nothing short of a life changer or at least to sh it, it's something that would show them that their voice matters. Even if you don't think you have something to say, we promise you do. And the stories that you tell um, are valuable and meaningful. And I don't know how often teenagers hear that. So I think that's something I want to express to them. Not every student feels like they've been heard. And I think this is a good 
project to get those voices out there. I think sometimes my students feel like they don't have a unique point of view. You know, we're kind of middle America, small town. I think they live in a world where sometimes they're told that it's adults that are the experts on everything and, and, and they're still learning and growing and, and they're not there yet. I think that all of my students need the opportunity to know that each of them are unique human beings who have something to contribute to the world. I think that uh, they all have unique stories to tell, uh, but not all of them feel that they have a platform to tell that story. And I think that this is one of many ways that I could get them to tell the story. I think that as adults, we, have, we should listen to what they have to say and it should be a dialogue. Even if they feel like, oh, I'm just a typical teenager, I'm really not special, um, that's not true. Like I talk to them every day and each of them has their own quirks and like weird things about them that I absolutely love. So I love that they get the chance to show that to the world. It was so interesting how many of them were saying that they were going to just be having their students use something that they literally did mm -hmm. when quarantine began, um, which I, I think makes a ton of sense. We became aware this spring that so many of you were asking kids to keep pandemic journals um, or otherwise bringing the news into your classroom. And so we know that that's already happening and museums are doing it too. It's just that the Learning Network has a big platform and so we're able to collect all this stuff in one place. Yeah, so so let's let's look at the nitty gritty. So now we know the big picture. Tell us the specifics. What are the rules for this contest? Okay, so there are a lot of little bitty dumb rules that I'm not going to go into because you can read them yourself. But there are two points that we really don't want you to leave this webinar without understanding, and and we've made them in various ways. But the first point is that we really uh, believe that every single kid has something to say right now and that we know teenagers, all of us taught teenagers, and many of them may believe that they don't have something to say. Um, I think you saw Kim Butterfield in that video say, we're just in middle America, you know, what, what's different about our life? They'd be surprised. We really want kids uh, to think about their perspective on this year, whichever the many events um, have most affected them and kind of ground it in who they are and tell us the story however they like. Um, you know, on the uh, website itself, if you look at the rules, it says that um, we're looking for, you know, we want kids from all 50 states. We want urban kids, we want rural kids, and we especially want kids who might feel like the New York Times is not a welcoming home to them, or, they, or the New York Times is intimidating, or maybe they don't see their own communities reflected in the Times that often. And those are the kids we really, really want to encourage. Okay, so what can students send in? This is where it gets a little crazy, guys, I'm gonna warn you, because we started to make a list this summer, like, well, what could they send? At first we were like, well, just writing. Well, that doesn't make sense. Writing and, and photos. Well, wait, a lot of kids wanna shoot video. Well, if video, why not audio? You can see our list is mayhem. It just keeps going, and this isn't even all of it. We're so happy about that. We want it to be a beautiful, like, collage of American teenage experience. Wow. How are we at the Learning Network going to you know what they mean to, to students? Are they just submitting the artifact on its own? Is uh, I'm assuming there's another part of this. Right. So, so as we say, and as that article says that uh, we keep going back to, the one about document your life, they use the example of grocery lists, right? Like if a kid gave us their grocery list, that would be fine. Um, one, one main reason, and again, I'm appealing to the teachers listening to this, you know this yourself, you often don't know why a kid, what the meaning behind something was until you come right out and ask. And what we found on our site, we do this with our photo contest, is that if we ask for an artist statement, often the work just springs into focus for us. So every single thing kids turn in need to have an artist statement with it, saying when was it created, why was it created, how was it created, um, and and what is it? How does it relate to the theme of the contest of coming of age in 2020 or being a teenager this year? So they'll have a chance, not just a chance. They have to tell us that when they turn something in. Okay, I, it's going to be really exciting to to see the the reasoning behind that, like like in the interactive we did. Um, so uh, one thing that I'm sure some of you who are listening and watching right now are thinking is, you know, where do I begin? Well, the Learning Network has you covered. 
So we put together a lot of resources for you to check out as you're, as you're getting started and as your students are getting started. So obviously we shared with you the contest details and submission. Uh, you can check that out. Uh, it's in your resource, it's in your resource guide um, and it's, it's on our website. We also have a four-step lesson plan that uh, we've also sent you a link to, to introduce it to kids, whether you're teaching virtually or face-to-face. -face. So it's going to show them how to look back and catalog what they've already created, decide what they most want to say and why they want to say it, make their contribution unique by grounding it in their unique identity and perspective, and finally, allow them to fool around with genre if they like to figure out how to best express it. So do they want to write an essay? Do they want to send photographs? A video can be anything. And then lastly, we have an entire writing unit that centers around this contest. We, we have writing units for uh, most of our contests, uh, and this is a great way to bring this contest into your curriculum and get students to develop their writing skills. So lots of resources for you if, if you're wondering where to begin um, or if you just want to dive right in, you can go for it. I, when, when I was a teacher, Catherine, I'm, I'm sure you had the same issue, uh, and I wanted to launch a new project. It was, you know, I kind of had a love-hate relationship with it because I was excited to kick off this new project. But I also, I, I also would get frustrated when I didn't have examples of what a great project should look like or maybe even just what students could do. So we went back to the teachers that, that we were speaking with last week. So you're going to hear from four different teachers who are starting to think of different things that their students can do and share a little bit about what they've started to do as well. So let's take a listen and a look. Hi, I'm Jennifer Carlson. I am Catherine Gulo. My name is Kendra Radcliffe. My name is Avery Pickford. I am a high school math teacher in San Francisco, California, and I teach at a school called Lick Wilberding High School. And I teach English to 10th, 11th, and 12th at North Hollywood High School, North Hollywood, California. And I teach ESOL, English for Speakers of Other Languages, at Glen Burnie High School in Glen Burnie, Maryland. I teach English grades 10 and 12 in Atlanta, Georgia. My school is Druid Hills High School. Last spring, one of the main things I asked them to do was to keep a blog about their experience. And so my students wrote three times a week about all of the things small and mundane to big and scary, all of the things that they were going through. It was just a lot of unknowns and students had to face you know, just unbelievable changes in their lives. And it produced some of the best writing I've seen for my students. So it was really exciting to think about being able to share that. And to me, like thinking about like, what would that look like or how might that look differently in the time of quarantine or the time of pandemics just got me just thinking about like the creative things my students might come up with if they had to kind of represent this time period um, in some visual way using some sort of data. I kind of just one night when I saw all the list of things that you guys had that students could do, because it was pretty much anything and pretty open. A diary, a journal, a song. Photography or art or um, just, you know, a grocery list or something like that. A scrapbook, something. And I was like, huh, this could be a really interesting cross-curricular project. What I want my students to do is to be able to take an experience that is so out of the ordinary and really reflect on how it's impacting their lives in writing or other media. First, look back at their text messages and even their Instagram, their social media posts throughout this time. Even when they're not in kind of an academic mindset, they're scrolling through Instagram, they're watching TikTok videos to have kind of these media literacy skills. You know, I always wrestled with them in class to put their phones down, but now I want them pick it up and know that that is a resource and they can turn it into something creative. Night Lab out of Northwestern University has a really cool digital storytelling platform and so my students are going to create timelines in order to share their first thinking about their experiences. Thinking about and reflecting on some ways that their life is different and then trying to uh, think about what data could tell that story. Uh, and beyond that, then how they could then kind of visualize that story with that data. I envision my students submitting a whole range. <laughs> I thought maybe, you know, just do something with poetry 
or creative writing. I know I've got a couple who are good at rapping in their own language, um, and they might be able to translate a bit of that into English. That would be really cool. Connecting food to it or talking about food in some way, shape, or form. One of the things that I'm excited about this project is I do think there's a lot of opportunity for just a lot of different types of submissions. And I'm excited to just see the creativity and what um, students come up with. I'm really looking forward to them really sort of digesting and contemplating and pulling together something that is compelling but still true to their own personal story. I know that math sometimes isn't thought of as being a really creative subject, so like the opportunities for kids to develop and create some really different looking things I think might be, might highlight what I see as the creativity in the subject. It's, it's exciting because I really don't know what I'm going to get, um, but you know, it'll, it'll be a variety for sure. All right, so projects about food, um, uh, timelines using uh, using um, uh, data visualization in a statistics class. Um, we spoke to teachers who are tying it into their AP curriculum. Uh, one thing you didn't hear was uh, Kathy Gullo uh, is tying this into a, a Shakespeare uh, unit that she started to do as she was warming students up. So, so many great options, uh, so many different angles for your students to take on this. So we're actually uh, coming towards the towards the end, and what we'd like everybody to do is we want to hear your ideas uh, because we know that there's tons out there, and we're already seeing these come in into the chat. So now that you've heard some ideas, we want you to reflect on how you might use this contest with your students. I'm going to mention a few that I see. Uh, Catherine, if you see any, feel free to uh, feel free to jump in. So uh, one person is uh, one person is interested in making this cross curricular. Um, uh, another person, uh, this isn't a project idea, but somebody mentioned how sharing samples, like examples from people who documented their time during 9/11. Uh, might, might be a good way to, to, to really show how somebody can do this. This is also fascinating. I want to slow it down, but I'm seeing like early on somebody posted, I might have my 12th graders and 7th graders collaborate. And somebody else was like, tell more about that, because that's a great idea. I see somebody thinking about doing it in, as a club, which is also great, um, as digital storytelling, as a way to tell the difference between primary and secondary sources. And I love that because it's something you have to teach anyway. And hello, let's make it real and relevant. Um, I mean, there's really too many ideas here. Digital time capsule keeps coming up. I love that. Somebody else yeah. said, uh, in this hot mess of a year, a lot of my students have been working, which that's fascinating, and I would love to hear from those kids. Um, you know, the frontline workers, the essential workers who are themselves teenagers. Um, I mean, there's no idea on here that isn't kind of getting the hair on my arms to stand up. Like, I just can't <laughs> wait for these all show up in our inbox. <laughs> I, I I can't agree I can't agree more. Uh, I know I think Jessica Hunter, a teacher who spoke in our first video, uh, she talked a little bit about doing digital scrapbooking and how this is a project that you you don't just have to do it in in 2020. Of course, 2020 is mm -hmm. is a moment mm -hmm. like no other. But you know she mm -hmm. she has thoughts for doing it down the line. Somebody even mentioned uh, documenting sports photographs during this time. No, so that's again, cool. absolutely no limit. Uh, it doesn't matter what curriculum yeah. <laughs> you teach. It, it, this really is a contest for, for everybody. Now, yeah, oral histories. Somebody is inspired by the guy, the Central Park birder who had that incident, and he made a comic of it. So they're going to have their kids do graphic, you know, graphic novel style 2020s. I mean, bring it on. Yeah, this is great. Now, OK, so obviously, Catherine, you're excited. I'm excited. We have teachers here who are excited, but I also uh, I also can't help but think about you know teachers out there who are um, interested in doing this. But you know, there's there's so much on everybody's plate right now. Everything that teachers are doing right now is is hard. Uh, and to add on another uh, another project, another thing, you know, is that going to be too challenging? And we're aware of that, and and it's, which is why we 
have this webinar. It's why we're, we're offering you a few resources. But we also talked to our teachers about that. And we wanted to know, you know, what is it about this contest that is making them want to do this even now? So let's take one more listen and, and then we'll come right back. So to any teacher who might be thinking, um, I have a lot going on and this feels overwhelming to add another thing, another project when I'm just trying to navigate and get through this day this week, I get it. I've been teaching for almost 10 years. Um, I know that where what we are being asked to do as teachers is a lot right now. I think because everything is new, you may as well try something new. I mean, everything is hard. Just go for it. It, it is something that you can tack on. It's not going to take students a ton of time. It's not something, you, they can use something that they already have. And in some ways, because it really speaks to the passions a student can have, it might be easier to get a student to engage in something that's really asking them about their own story. Any way that we can increase our students' motivation, especially in a time when their motivation might be lacking, this is a way to do it. This concept is universal. So, you know, it's something that other teachers could use in different disciplines and we could use next year, even when hopefully there isn't a global pandemic going on. You know, this is a moment that is unlike any other. So we need to take advantage of that and harness it. Once you get rolling with the project, it's super student-centered and project-based. They're doing the work and you are there to navigate, to facilitate conversation, to help them out, to inspire them. If we honor their voices, um, they are going to be more compelled to do everything else that we're asking them to do in class. If they get published, you know, or win a contest on top of that that gets national recognition, I mean, come on, that's wonderful. Well, we uh, we hope we've been able to, you know, maybe answer some questions about uh, about this project, give you a lot of ideas. So I do want to thank you, Catherine, for joining us today and for talking to us about this contest. I th this is very, very exciting. Please, thank you, teachers. I'm so excited by everything in this chat. <laughs> <laughs> so again, for uh, from everybody at the Learning Network, I'm Ross Flat. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next time. Take care.